Welcome everybody to our second QMUL Law Alumni Seminar for 2022. I'm Mario Mendez, a reader in law at Queen Mary. This series was conceived as a way for us to nurture our links with our law alumni and keep us engaged with each other. And we are delighted that alumni from all over the world have been able to participate. The speakers have been a combination of alumni and QM law faculty. The URL at the bottom of the PowerPoint that you can hopefully all see and which you which I'll be posting in the chat box later as well has the links for videos to the prior seminars and the sign up details for forthcoming ones also will be available on this URL. As you can see to come next month, we have alumna Dr Ramsunda speaking on state responsibility for the support of armed groups in the Commission of International Crimes. And in May, Dr Merkins, also alumni, who will be presenting on the timely topic of the UK as a regional state. Turning now to the main events and our speaker for today, it is a great honour for me to be able to introduce one of our most distinguished alumni, Professor Christine Chinkin. We are delighted at Queen Mary that she was able to accept this invitation to speak. She'll be talking on the subject of women, peace, security and international law. Christine completed her LLB and LLM at Queen Mary and went on to become a member of the faculty. She later held posts at the universities of Sydney and Southampton, also having been the Dean of the Law Faculty at the University of Southampton. And she was for many years a professor of international law at the LSE. She is currently professorial research fellow at the LSE Center for Women, Peace and Security, a center of which she was a founding director. She is also a global law professor at the University of Michigan. She is the author and co-author of seminal works in international law, including, just to mention some of the book length contributions, Third Parties in International Law, published in 1993, The Boundaries of International Law of Feminist Analysis, published in 2000, The Making of International Law, published in 2007, and International Law and New Wars, published in 2017, and a new book, Women, Peace, and security and international law that was published earlier this year. Christine was elected a fellow of the British Academy in 2009, a distinction that very few scholars in the humanities and um, social sciences obtain. She is also a barrister and member of Matrix Chambers. She was a member of the Human Rights Advisory Panel in Kosovo from 2010 to 2016 and scientific advisor to the Council of Europe's Committee for the Drafting of the Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, otherwise known as the Istanbul Convention. In 2017, she was appointed by the Queen a Companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George for services to advancing women's human rights worldwide. In short, our speaker for today is one of the most distinguished scholars of international law and one who has made a particularly powerful contribution to the advancement of women's rights. Now, before passing the floor, virtual floor that is, to Christine, a quick word on the format. Christine will be speaking for about 35 minutes, and this aspect of the seminar will be recorded. We then go to our Q&A session that is not recorded. Can I remind the audience to please keep their mics off during the presentation itself? Thank you very much. And Christine, please do start when you are ready. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mario. Um, very warm, um, nice introduction. Um, it's good to be back at Queen Mary, only it would be even better if I was actually back down on the Mile End Road, rather than in a virtual um, Queen Mary. So thank you um, for the invitation to speak today. So what I'm going to talk about is my most recent focus in international law what's become known as the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, and to raise some questions about it, both as an international lawyer and as a feminist. So first, just to describe what is meant by the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. In a, in a nutshell, Women, Peace and Security, or WPS, is about always asking the woman question in conflict, thereby bringing women's experiences of conflict into international law and decision-making, about promoting a concept of peace and of security that is relevant to women as well as men and giving effect to a gendered analysis of conflict and post-conflict that provides stakeholders, states, international and national institutions and local communities 
with the basis for gender sensitive policy making and operations. Um, so to be rather more specific than that nutshell overview, WPS within the United Nations commenced with Security Council Resolution 1325 adopted in 2000 within the Security Council's framework for the maintenance of international peace and security. 1325 expresses the Security Council's concern that civilians, particularly women and children, account for the vast majority of those adversely affected by armed conflict, including as refugees and as internally displaced persons. They are increasingly targeted by combatants and in armed conflict. And so from this starting point, the council then makes three suggestions to the various stakeholders. It calls for a gender balance in women's participation in conflict resolution and peace processes. So this is the numbers part of the agenda. And so it calls for greater numbers of women in conflict resolution, management and prevention, and also more women in various UN field operations. It calls, secondly, it calls upon all actors involved in post-conflict reconstruction to ensure what it calls a gender perspective in all decision and policy making in, uh, and in the aftermath of conflict. So to quote, making the concerns and experiences of women and men, girls and boys, an integral part of the design, implementation, review and evaluation of policies, programs and military operations. Um, the quote is actually not the Security Council, it's actually the UK government explaining a gender perspective. And then the third element of 1325 is the demand for accountability and an end of impunity for the perpetrators of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, including those who have perpetrated sexual and other forms of violence against women and girls. Um, 1325 is a Security Council resolution has become almost iconic, if such a thing can be said about a Security Council resolution. It's said to be one of the most frequently referenced Security Council resolutions. But of course, one resolution doesn't make an agenda. And it wasn't in fact for eight years until we have a follow-up Women, Peace and Security Council resolution. That's resolution 1820 in 2008. 1820 shifts the focus explicitly to sexual violence and armed conflict. It demands protection of women and girls from sexual violence and armed conflict. It recognizes the disproportionate targeting of women and girls and asserts that when sexual violence is used as a tactic of war in order to deliberately target civilians or as part of a widespread or systematic attack against civilian populations, Sexual violence can significantly exacerbate situations of armed conflict. It may impede the restoration of international peace and security. Accordingly, effective steps to prevent and respond to such acts of sexual violence can, can significantly contribute to the maintenance of international peace and security, thereby tying sexual violence explicitly to the Security Council's agenda for the maintenance of international peace and security. Now, this is a second landmark resolution. It clarifies that rape and sexual violence are not just unfortunate byproducts of war. You know, it just happens in war, but that they may be and are used as a deliberate tactic and weapon of war. A later resolution adopted in 2015 extended the understanding of rape and sexual violence as a tactic of war to also encompass a tactic of terror. Now, 2015, you may remember, was when ISIS was um, carrying out its bloody rampage through northern Iraq and Syria. And what the Security Council was doing, although it doesn't explicitly mention ISIS, is highlighting the deliberate use of sexual violence as part of the ideology and strategic objectives of the group, that they use sexual violence to increase their power and to contribute to the destruction of communities, such as the Yazidi community. So there are eight further WPS resolutions, hence the term agenda, and 10 in total. Taken together, it's often said that Women, Peace and Security today comprises four so-called pillars. 
two I've already mentioned, part increasing, enhancing women's participation and representation in all aspects of decision making around conflict in its aftermath, prevention of sexual violence, and importantly, but not developed within the resolutions, prevention of conflict itself. Protection against sexual violence and other forms of violence for women and girls, primarily through measures such as enhancing military discipline, upholding military command responsibility, training troops on the categoric prohibition of sexual violence, um, more broadly debunking myths that fuel sexual violence. So a whole host of measures directed very much at military um, perpetration of sexual violence, but then also provisions relating to enhancing women's access to justice and transitional justice programs. And then the fourth pillar is relief and recovery, including humanitarian delivery and longer term post-conflict reconstruction processes. Some of the later Women, Peace and Security resolutions also emphasize women's empowerment and the need for states to build the capacity of civil society groups, particularly women's organizations, to um, carry out measures for protection against um, conflict affected sexual violence at the local level and within local communities. Um, the Women, Peace and Security resolutions have also led to an absolute mass of institutional development. And it's often said that there's effectively a women, peace and security industry now at the institutional level. So there are new posts and positions within the United Nations, within NATO, within other organizations. These include women protection officers on the ground, gender advisors appointed to UN peace operations, perhaps most significantly, the creation of a special representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations on sexual violence and armed conflict. The um, SRSG, um, essentially report on the incidence of sexual violence and armed conflict, the patterns and trends that are observed by her office. She reports to the Security Council and also provides detailed information on individuals or groups that are credibly suspected of committing or being responsible for acts of rape or other forms of sexual violence, listing these groups or individuals in her report and then um, opening up the possibility of targeted sanctions introduced by the Security Council against such individuals or groups. There's also multiple teams of experts working on such things as documentation, collation of evidence, criminal investigation, etc., and working with national authorities on reintroduction of the rule of law and putting an end to such sexual violence. Um, I think it's important to emphasize that while um, WPS has taken on form as a Security Council agenda. Its origins were very much in women's civil society. So Resolution 1325 was a successful outcome of a um, 100 years, it's, it's, uh, at least a century, of campaigns and activism by women um, carried out through peace campaigns, peace marches, petitions, working through the League of Nations and subsequently through the United Nations. And the adoption of 1325 was accordingly celebrated by women's organizations as both a women's peace resolution and a women's human rights resolution. And in particular for bringing matters of concern to women for the first time ever into the pinnacle of power within the United Nations into the Security Council. But I think that there's also, you know, sort of the perspective of 20 years later, um, questioning as to whether in fact this was a good move. The question has to be asked what was gained and what was lost by turning to the Security Council um, for the presentation of women's demands relating to peace and human rights. Yes, it certainly engages the, the authority of the Security Council. But on the other hand, it has also subjected the women's peace and human rights agenda to the power politics of the Council, notably of the permanent five members. It's noticeable that throughout the 10 resolutions on women, peace and security, 
that many of the concerns that were um, expressed by women during the century of campaigning and so on um, are barely mentioned. Peace, for example, is very little referenced within the re re resolutions. Demands by women's NGOs for demilitarization and disarmament that are essential to conflict prevention are not included within any of the resolutions. And the notion of women's security has become very much enmeshed with um, counter-terrorism, counter-violent extremist agendas of the Security Council, with very much a flavor that the importance of the agenda to the council is that women can be brought into their campaigns for counter-terrorism and counter um, countering violent, um, violent extremism. Um, an instrumentalization, if you like, of women that was certainly not part of the women's NGO agenda. Um, on another front, the agenda remains firmly rooted in the gender binary distinction between women and men. We've, we may have just lost you for a moment there, Christine. Oh, um, oh no, you're back. Or maybe it was just me, but no, you seem to be back. It may have just been me, so sorry to interrupt. Oh, um, how long? <laughs> well... <laughs> Okay. Sorry, at my end, it was just momentarily for a couple of seconds. Sorry. No, it was off. fine for us, I feel. Okay. Right. Sorry. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, well, I was just saying that the agenda remains firmly rooted in the gender binary distinction between women and men. And some, despite some provision relating to women's empowerment and leadership, um, there are clearly stereotypical roles of each within the, re the resolutions. So, for example, women are primarily presented as victims in need of protection and are assumed simply somehow to be good at peace in some way or another. Men are implicitly and simultaneously both the perpetrators of and protectors against sexual and other forms of gender violence. Only two resolutions refer at all to conflict related sexual violence against men and there is no reference to those who are targeted for their sexuality or for their gender identity. And while the resolutions are forward looking in that they recognize that sexual violence is not just random or a byproduct of conflict, um, deliberately used as a tactic of war, it's all, the resolutions are also limiting by failing to address the root causes of such violence, such as the social and economic inequalities, subordination of women, that pre-exists any particular conflict situation and that feeds into a continuum of violence that goes from pre-conflict so-called peacetime through conflict and continues in the aftermath of conflict. Sexual violence is decontextualized in the uh, resolutions. So there is also no reference to its multiple forms, for instance, um, or to the multiple perpetrators um, of sexual violence and um, its commission in conjunction with other aspects of violence and armed conflict, including pillage, displacement, refugee flows, etc. Um, so, um, sort of while it is obviously beneficial that it is brought to the fore, there are these concerns about the limiting nature of the way it's presented within the resolutions. Um, just a word about the um, last resolutions. The last two WPS resolutions were adopted in 2019. Up until that date, all previous resolutions had been adopted by consensus. But in 2019, there was considerably more controversy. Russia and China, for instance, raised that the Security Council, a body concerned with security, international peace and security, was not the appropriate place for adopting provisions relating to human rights. Within the UN structure, human rights should be preserved for the General Assembly, ECOSOC, Human Rights Council, the human rights treaty bodies. Um, Russia and China accordingly both abstained from the two 2019 resolutions. The United States, under the then Trump administration, rejected language that had been included in earlier resolutions relating to the provision to survivors of sexual violence of sexual and reproductive health services including relating to pregnancy resulting from rape. And the United States at that point threatened to veto the resolution if such language was included. And so language was removed from the draft resolution relating to sexual and reproductive health services. Now resolutions are accumulative. 
one resolution does not displace an earlier resolution. And so it can be argued that the language relating to sexual and reproductive health continues to exist, but nevertheless, removing it, omitting it from a later resolution does appear to weaken that resolution. Okay, so where does women, peace and security stand within international law? Is it an issue for international lawyers? Now, the language is not that of international law. It's the language of international relations, international peace and security. It's the language of good governance, participation, monitoring, indicators, reporting, etc. It's the language of development, empowerment, leadership, the language of international institutions. With subsets of these various disciplines, such as conflict, security, and peace studies. And of course, the language of gender permeates the resolutions, albeit largely as a synonym for women and girls, and not located within any gender theory. The state centric emphasis of international law is weakened by requests for actions by a whole range of, part of uh, actors, including parties to armed conflict international institutions, international personnel, men and boys, civil society. It's an agenda that seeks to shape behavior, policy and decision-making by all of these different actors, as well as by states. And something I think which feels unfamiliar to international lawyers with our folk, central focus on the state. So this leads on to a further question. Is it in fact a legal regime creating legally binding obligations for states and for other actors? as is claimed by many of the proponents of Women, Peace and Security. Now, on its own terms, Resolution 1325 was at its inception grounded in international law. It calls for an instance upon, quote, all parties to armed conflict to respect fully international law applicable to the rights and protection of women and girls, especially as civilians. It reinforces the applicability of key instruments of international humanitarian law, of refugee law, of human rights law, in particular relating to the human rights of women and children, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women and the Convention on the Rights of the Child are both referenced in, uh, in Resolution 1325. And international criminal law is also brought into the resolution through calling for criminal accountability for the commission of sexual violence as a war crime, crimes against humanity. And again, the Rome Statute that established the International Criminal Court is also referenced. So where there is already existing international law, clearly they are binding as such. Rape and sexual violence, for instance, have long been prohibited under international humanitarian law and also recognized as violations of human rights. CEDAW already requires women's equal participation in political decision-making. So it can be argued that in fact, the resolutions add little new in that context. Further, some of the resolutions explicitly incorporate principles of existing law. Um, for instance, resolution adopted in 2019, quote, recalls the applicable provisions of international law on the right to an effective remedy for human rights violations. But the resolutions also contain provisions that go beyond existing law. Or, so, for example, there is no treaty requirement on states to prosecute crimes against humanity, at least not at present, or to exclude sexual violence from amnesty arrangements. So in such cases, has the Security Council in fact created new obligations for states and other actors? And this brings us to the sources of international law, which as all international lawyers know, are primarily treaty law and customary international law. Security Council resolutions as such are not um, within those categories of sources of law. So to create new obligations, they must either, they Security Council resolutions must either constitute a further source of law or perhaps have generated new customary international law. Now the Charter, the UN Charter, does provide that member states agree to carry out decisions of the Security Council. In practice, primarily those related to enforcement action in particular countries that have been designated as a situation constituting a threat to international peace and security. WPS resolutions are different. They relate to the generic situation of women in armed conflict, not to a particular country, and nor 
and they have been termed thematic rather than enforcement resolutions. The council does not use mandatory language in these resolutions. It does not decide that states and other bodies should act in specific ways. Rather, it uses the language of urging, encouraging, calling upon, requesting certain steps and measures. And in my view, and contrary to that of many others, these are not decisions of the Security Council that under, uh, that under the UN Charter, member states have agreed to accept and carry out. So the next question is, well, perhaps, or another argument, perhaps they have generated customary international law and are binding as customary international law. And for the non-international lawyers here today, customary international law evolves through consistent and uniform state practice and a belief in states that they are acting in accordance with the law, the so-called opinio juris. Now, there is an absolute mass and wealth of state and institutional practice that has emerged in the name of women, peace and security since 2000. Um, I'm obviously not going to go through it all, but I think one striking example is the conclusion by nearly 100 states, 51% of the UN membership of so-called national action plans for the implementation of resolution 1325 and its successive resolutions. National action plans or NAPs are the process through which policy agendas agreed at the international level are brought into domestic policy and lawmaking. And states that have concluded NAPs include states from the global north, the United Kingdom, United States, most of Europe, from the global south, states from Africa, Asia, and South America, post-conflict states, Bosnia, Timor-Leste, countries currently conflict-affected, South Sudan, Afghanistan, Ukraine, and the territories of contested legal status, Palestine, Kosovo. So this impressive list um, satisfies a stipulation from the International Court of Justice that the practice be widespread, representative, and include states that are most affected by the particular practice. The NAPs have also generated multiple internal activities. They are used in particular by non-governmental organizations for advocacy as leverage in pushing for gender sensitive policies and laws with respect to peace and security at the domestic level. So here in the UK, for example, a, an NGO GAPS, Gender Action for Peace and Security, works specifically on holding the UK government to account, preparing a shadow report on the UK's progress with respect to its national action plan. There's also an all party parliamentary group on WPS, bringing together parliamentarians from across all parties who have a special interest in the subject. Other examples of state practice include legislation. The United States, for example, has a statute on women, peace and security. Appointment of ministerial positions, inclusion in national and regional defense strategies. Involving, for the UK NAP, for example, involves the MOD and the FCDO. Mainstreaming into other programs for promoting gender equality. So there is a huge amount of state activity alongside the institutional activity that I mentioned earlier that might suggest an involving rule of customary international law. But is it consistent state practice? And I think a particular problem is the weakness of enforcement and implementation of WPS. The resolutions themselves have minimal enforcement measures. The Secretary General has been charged with um, organizing indicators for monitoring and evaluation but these remain inadequate. There's no systematic reporting requirement such as that under the UN human rights treaty bodies or under the universal periodic review before the Human Rights Council. There is no dedicated Security Council committee such as those on sanctions or on counterterrorism. So the Security Council does not evaluate state implementation of the agenda and where appropriate demand improved performance. And of course, what we can see on a practical level is that sexual violence in armed conflict remains a scourge. Just look at the current conflict in Tigray, and also there are reports already coming out of Ukraine to that effect. The annual report of the SRSG on women, peace and security references continuing sexual violence in all conflicts on the council's agenda. 
There are some moves towards greater prosecution, but in general, impunity remains the norm. Despite the many calls for greater women's participation, women in Syria, Yemen, and Afghanistan have all had to demand participation in various peace talks and with limited success. In his 2021 report on women, peace, and security to the Security Council, the Secretary General noted that the juxtaposition of violence targeting women on the one hand and their extreme marginalization and exclusion on the other still encapsulates the women, peace and security agenda. He would call it a great chasm between the two. And he also went on to note that much of the WPS agenda was de directly relevant to states' responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. For instance, the requirements for women's participation and provisions for relief and recovery. But he explained, the reality is that the advent of COVID and measures in response to the pandemic have pushed women, peace and security implementation even further back again. The Secretary General noted that only 42% of the over 3,100 policy measures adopted globally in response to the pandemic can, could be considered gender sensitive. Women made up only one quarter of members among COVID-19 task forces that were examined across 36 conflict and post-conflict countries. So women were not primarily involved in decision-making around responses to the pandemic. So is this non-implementation violation of legal obligation or simply an indication of insufficient evidence of state practice to support any claim at all that WPS constitutes customary international law? I think a number of factors should just be taken into account in thinking about this. First, the agenda is broad in scope and covers numerous issues. This should require separate evaluation of legal status to be made to different aspects of the agenda. There cannot be a single conclusion to be made about all aspects of the agenda. Secondly, this is also true of national action plans. They vary enormously in emphasis, in priorities, degree of detail, concrete action, and financial commitment. And in particular, there's a marked contrast between NAPs from states in the global north, primarily donor states, and those in the global south, primarily recipients of AIDS. The former, the global north, are external looking and look to direct their attention towards what they can do in other states, while the latter are more directed to what they should do with respect to their own internal um, situations. These variations make problematic any conclusion about uniform and consistent practice. And again, language, which I've already mentioned. Uh, many of the terms repeated throughout the resolutions are imprecise and undefined. What is empowerment? What is uh, protection, security, meaningful participation? Lack of precision undermines the certainty required for legal obligation. So my own conclusion is that WPS, it does not at this stage constitute binding legal obligation, apart from those areas that are already required by existing legal regimes. But this then raises two further questions for me. The first relates to the methodology for determining customary international law. This is a long-term methodology that was, um, has been in, in effect since the time of the Permanent Court of International Justice way back at the time of the League of Nations. Does it work today? There's been a lot of discussion around um, customary international law among international lawyers, um, but the trend from the International Law Commission recently remains pretty much in place as it always has been. But the WPS agenda simply does not fit into this methodology of examining state practice. The agenda has emerged from sustained interaction between civil society, women activists and NGOs, successes member states and Security Council, other like-minded states, UN entities. Its key principles have been formulated through resolutions of women organizations, global summit meetings, expert bodies, treaty provisions, diplomatic negotiations. This context problematizes the approach to determining customary international law as too formalistic and conservative? Should we instead be looking for new ways of making international law more in line with the contemporary interactions of multiple actors 
that is even more essential, I think, in an era when multilateral treaty making has apparently fallen out of favour. And this has much broader significance than just women's peace and security. Other areas need more uh, regulation and ability to determine international legal regimes. Um, managing epidemics, pandemics, may be one such example. And secondly, I feel a great uneasiness about an agenda that has generated so much activity. As I said, in the UK, across the FCDO, the MOD, they're currently working on a new national action plan within NATO, within the EU, within the African Union, globally. And yet it remains outside the framework of contemporary international law. And this makes me wonder about the difference between states saying they make a commitment to states recognizing that they have a binding legal obligation. Why, in fact, do they make public statements relating to commitment when they apparently have little attention of making them effective? Or if they do have such intentions, they drop them or fail to remember them when they decide upon other priorities. And I also feel, why is it that it's always women's rights that are the first to be discarded? So those are a couple of legal concerns. But to conclude, to say a couple of words about where the agenda is politically today. I said that the two resolutions adopted in 2019 were controversial and contested. This has, been, this has continued. There have been no new resolutions since 2019, although there was an assumption that there would be a celebration of the 20th anniversary in of 1325 in 2020 with a new resolution. COVID, of course, intervened, and we also saw increased rates of violence against women during the pandemic, including in conflict-affected areas. Conflict is a vector both of disease and of gender-based violence. So during the pandemic and continuing, humanitarian aid bodies have been unable to provide services to, sur to survivors, resources have been diverted away from these issues. But irrespective of the pandemic, there was concern that the agenda was stagnating or worse, going backwards, with women's NGOs expressing the view that a new resolution would only be a distraction. What was needed was political commitment to implementation and allocation of appropriate long-term resources. The Russian Federation that had the presidency in 2020 did put forward a draft resolution. It was not adopted through failure to gain the 10 affirmative votes required. Belgium perhaps explained the decision to abstain in a way that um, expressed the views of many other states. Belgium said, should the draft resolution be adopted, it would erode the hard won gains of our predecessors. Explicitly, the draft did not meet the minimum standard with regard to the indispensable role of civil society to implement the WPS agenda on the ground. The resolution did not adequately reflect women's leading role in tackling the pandemic. There was insufficient reference to normative frameworks, including CEDAW, the Women's Convention. There was lack of meaningful language on the implementation of or accountability for WPS and more was needed on financing and on overcoming the structural barriers to gender equality that are the root causes of the continuum of gender-based violence against women and which is heightened in emergencies such as the pandemic and of course what we are seeing with climate change. Further, all of this must be seen against what we have at the moment of the backdrop of the pushback against women's rights. We see this globally in the abuse of the so-called gender ideology on increased attacks on women and environmental human rights defenders and a general retreat from human rights obligations. Um, I think the situation is looking grim at present on that. And finally, and perhaps particularly poignantly in light of the contemporary news relating to Ukraine, where is peace on the agenda? It's called Women, Peace and Security. But one speaker at the 2021 open debate last October found, again to quote, shocking that even at the height of a global pandemic, military spending in much of the world was greater than that on pandemic related health spending. The reality is that the council remains unwilling to address disarmament and the dismantling of the culture of militarism that are essential to achieving the women, peace and security agenda, or indeed peace in any form. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Christine, for that fascinating presentation and obviously um, troubling presentation in the sense of uh, the state of affairs um, in relation to the WPS um, agenda at the, at the current moment. Um, so we now stop recording and.